Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, my very biased collection as usual. Um, today I would like to talk about a theorem which is known as Fagin's theorem, Fagin's theorem, not quite sure. So um, maybe, so at least uh, there's a wonderful book on this topic by Bolobas, uh, Random Graph Theory, linked in the description. And Bolobas says, well, it's due to Fagin. Um, but essentially what it is, it is a statement about, well, statements. It's a statement about statements. It's a statement about statements about graphs. So a, a meta theorem, if you want. Um, it's really beautiful. And it's roughly, well, 50, 40 years old. By now, it has been beefed up several times. Um, so it's kind of this idea that essentially everything that you can state will be uh, almost always true or almost always false. It's kind of a, kind of a very strange thing. So very rarely you have something, whatever rarely means, you have something that is somehow in between um, and it's true in 50% of all cases, it kind of almost never happens. So essentially all statements are all, almost uh, always true or almost always false. Which, as I said, I kind of feel like it's a bit, well, uh, counterintuitive in some sense. Uh, we will see the precise statement. It will be about graphs and it will be about second, first order logic only because that's kind of what you can prove. But it's more a statement about first order logic itself than about graphs. You just prove it for graphs and for graphs it just has a really nice incarnation. Uh, so stay with me. So I'm trying to explain the sentence down here so that something is almost always true or that something is almost always false. And yeah, so just to set up notation, um, I only want kind of simple graphs in this video. This really just means I have my little graph here, like this one, and I don't allow those parallel edges here, so I don't like them. And I also don't allow loops. That's essentially just for convenience. Those things are just easier to study. Um, and you will see kind of in my random model, well, certainly not my random model, in the random model I'm going to use, it's kind of very useful to don't have parallel edges. But anyway, so simple graphs are those without parallel edges. So this is a simple graph. This is not a simple graph. It has parallel or multiple edges, whatever you want to say. Uh, so here, for example, so we don't like that. And we also don't like loops. And a very simple setup, the easiest one for graphs you can imagine, just a bunch of vertices and a bunch of edges, but the edges are just not parallel and not loops. That's it. And I will just call that graph because I'm very lazy. Anyway, and a random graph, at least in this video, will be the following. So for each pair of vertices, so here I have a vertex here, let's say, and you have a vertex here, whatever, V and W, and you want to decide whether you put an edge between them or not. And you essentially do that by flipping a coin. Uh, but le let's say your coin is allowed to be take any kind of value between uh, zero and one for the probability of hats. And that is what was called a, a random graph. So for each uh, pair of vertices, you flip a coin, might be a biased coin, but you flip a coin and the coin decides for you whether you put an edge or not. And that's my very, very simple uh, random graph model here. And I kind of want to make a statement about random graphs in general. And a random graph should uh, model a generic graph in some sense. So if you would just have, if you would imagine if a back and in your back are all graphs, let's say that would be possible, and you just draw and something out of your back, uh, a graph, then on average, it should be a random graph, right? So that's kind of the, the point here. Random graphs are average graphs, if you want. Um, at least if you would set P to be one half, so the, the non-biased coin flip, then this would be kind of really certainly true in some sense. Anyway, so what I really like are those coin flip graphs, because as I said, um, this just means P equals 0 0.5. So we don't have a biased graph. Everything I say actually works for the other ones as well, but then there are some restrictions on the piece, uh, on the probability. So let's not worry about that. And let's just stick with the setting of having a coin toss graph. So really a non-biased graph. So for each edge now, I honestly, so V and W, I honestly just put an edge with probability 0 0.5. And as I said, I would like to think of those as being like average type graphs, at least if the number of vertices is really, really large, because somehow um, the laws of big numbers, somehow this thing will converge in a, a certain sense. 
Anyway, so that's just the setting. And if you, if you look at those, so here my uh, coin toss graph generated with Mathematica, uh, eventually they have a lot of edges. <laughs> so this one here has a lot of edges and kind of all graphs have a lot of edges. Um, so for, for very large N, coin toss graphs are kind of generic graphs. And we like to st study them for N very, very large, as I said, because that's kind of the limit where the coin toss experiment, for example, would stabilize as well. And the point is um, kind of all patterns kind of, or most patterns or seem to somehow stabilize or most so most patterns either stabilize or kind of drop out in their completely wrong way. Um, and in some sense, this studies all graphs because all graphs are very large anyway. So there's this idea that in our minds, there are only very small numbers and we can't really think of very large numbers, but essentially all numbers are very large. And so essentially all graphs have a lot of vertices. So this is not really a restriction. It's just, uh, I don't know. Uh, they're hard to illustrate eventually. But anyway, so the point I'm going to make here, what I'm trying to make is that those graphs are kind of generic graphs, if you want. So those graphs are generic and it, it seems to be that some pattern seems to stabilize in a good way, so they are true, or in a bad way, of course, they are false. And this is exactly what I wanted to uh, to go at, right? They're always, almost always true or almost always false. And that's what you can prove. Um, kind of very interesting type of statement. So a property in, in first order logic, I will comment on that in a second. I will call that fall, uh, why not? Uh, so it holds true almost all, uh, for almost all coin toss, coin toss graphs, or it's false for almost all of them, which is kind of very strange. So any property in forced order logic is almost always true or almost always false. So there are only two options and there's nothing in between. So uh, very similar as in my little, or well, not my, as in the XKCD um, co comic here, there are only two options well, if you just read it, so either 300 or a billion, and there's nothing in between. And that's exactly what this theorem says, essentially. Uh, it says it about graphs. It's kind of a very strange statement. So either everything is wrong all the time, like almost all the time, obviously, and or everything is correct almost all the time. And this is, in some sense, surprising, in some sense, a bit disappointing, because, well, first order logic graph theory, uh, fold graph theory, is somehow quite uninteresting. You don't have any really interesting statements because they're almost always true or they're almost always false. And that's kind of an interesting, um, well, or disappointing, depends a little bit, uh, fact, not quite about graphs itself. So if you look at the proof, it's not really about graphs. Obviously, they will be about graphs, but it's more about properties of first order logic. So they tend to have very easy models in some sense. So first order logic in some sense is too weak to study randomness, if you want, or generic behavior, whatever you want to call it. So you always end up with uh, the two options, 300 or a billion, right? Well, depending a bit uh, what you want. So we only have two options. So first order logic, um, is, well, let me just define what first first order logic graph theory is. So it's, it's actually a very simple theory. And this is why if you really analyze the theorem a little bit further, it's maybe not surprising anymore because the theory is just ridiculously simple. So first order logic graph theory is you only have the adjacency relation, like here's my vertex, here's my vertex, and they might be connected or not. And the equality relation, whether two vertices are the same. Okay, these are the only relations and Quantifying is only allowed, like uh, those guys here, uh, over elements of the graph. So that's the first order thing. You only quantify over elements of the graph. And there are many, many statements actually, which are not first order logic. Uh, even something simple like G is connected because you would need to quantify over paths. If you think about, if you think this through, you will realize that you actually need to quantify over paths, but that's kind of not possible if you only can quantify over vertices. So although this theorem sounds, sounds very kind of disappointing and surprising, it's more about first order logic being quite weak. Um, and you really want to do some second order or higher order logic. And then you get more interesting statements, although some of them are almost always true, like, like this one, for example. 
Um, but certainly graph theoretical statements, like standard statements, like connected bipartite or Hamiltonian, they're not first order logic, so they're not really covered by this theorem. Okay, so kind of a weird theorem in some sense. In some sense, it's really disappointing, but if you think about it a little bit more carefully, you realize that most properties are actually not first order logic, and it's kind of a flaw of first order logic, if you want. So this theorem is kind of a justification why people, if you want at least, why people started studying higher order logic, because strictly speaking, first order logic is so weak. Um, so you can only sum up first order logic is equal to, let me just say it uh, very briefly, in well, <laughs> in a nutshell, uh, is equal to if you can only quantify over elements and not over anything else, and that kind of is really really restrictive, right? Already in my little example, I can't quantify over past, so there's not much I can do anyway. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I also hope to see you next time.